Hello, welcome to Talking May with a Bowtie Boy. I'm Tom Saviello, and I have my special guests here. At least one of them is special. The other <laughs> one's kind of bad. And you are? I'm Sarah Boyden. I'm a regional wildlife biologist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Sarah, yes, welcome to the thank show. You. I'm, thank and you. you are? Uh, Scott Landry. I live here in Farmington. Aren't you the representative for the area? Yes, I do represent Farmington, and I happen to be the chair of the Inland Fishery and Wildlife. So we have Committee. one of the good people who do all of the work, <laughs> as we called them when I was in college, the ra rabbit sheriffs. There you go. They go out and give, you look for those sheriff rabbits running yeah. around and arrest them if they've been bad. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to call us stump jumpers. Right. <laughs> yep. yep. It, it's the only profession I know, and I shared this, I think, when Judy was on. She was on the show a couple of years ago, that we had to do a wildlife class, two-week wildlife class in our summer camp. And in order to estimate the deer population, we had to go into this cornfield and grids hmm. and look for a deer poopy. Oh yeah, interesting. And you'd count how many you found yeah. and then you went back and you could do the statistics to pr pr predict how many deer were in the mm -hmm. area. Yeah. It's a lot of what we do actually. <laughs> On a much bigger scale, yes, oh, yes, yeah, yes a lot of. So, Yep. You're, tell us a little bit about yourself, Sarah. Yeah, so I grew up in Maine. I'm from Clinton originally. I grew up on a dairy farm over there. And um, originally I thought I would be a veterinarian. It was kind of, we had a, a woman vet that would come to the farm, and I sort of liked that. And then I actually came here to school and sort of got into biology and realized that I didn't want to spend all that time for vet school. So wildlife ended up being my path. And um, I've been with the department for four years, but I've been in the field of wildlife biology for about 20. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. All so a lot of experience. Yeah, yeah. So which dairy farm were you in? in the Clinton? Boyden Farm Boyden. on the Hinkley Road, yeah. Near Poverty Flats, the old airport there. Because uh, it always fascinated me. I went up there to the, um, um, not the flood farm, but there was the other farm. that Kayleys and Wrights. And they turned their, their uh, cow manure into methane. Oh, huh. And, uh, they, and because we went up to see that, but that's a yeah, whole yeah. story. Right. Yeah. So did you go to Orno? I went to Farmington oh, University. Did you, yep. you did? Yep, when did I you graduate? Did. Um, I think it was 03 or 02, so okay. almost 20 years ago. And what was your major here? Biology. 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 Yep. So yep. Then you decided to not to not to go to vet school. Yeah, after. yes. So Better you, path. So how many years have you been with Fish and Wildlife? Um, so about four and a half. So I, I did some contract technician work at Clayton Lake actually before. So I spent sort of three years bouncing around with that. and then, oh, We were talking yeah. about Clayton Lake because yeah. it's one of, my, one of my favorite places, yep. international paper company. So you were yeah. there when, who, who owned it at the time? Um, so the Pelletiers were managing a lot of the land around there when we were there. Because so. IP sold it yep. as part of their yep. partnership, got out of it, and, right. and then spent a lot of time in the depot. Yeah. A lot of yeah. time in the bunkhouse, yep. and then as is the bunkhouse, and then as what I called the big house, oh, okay. where uh, uh, what's his name used to live. He has a camp across the Clayton Lake. Hmm. Oh, my goodness! But anyway, he not LaBeouf. Maybe it was LaBeouf. Hmm. During the Depression, just to give you a little history of that, then we we'll go back to you. Yeah. The Catholic Church gave him gold to pay his workers. Oh because they felt it was better to keep people working than it was on bread lines. Hmm. So they would come in on, on Monday nights and yeah. go home on Thursdays, and he would pay them out of gold. Huh. And that safe is in the basement of oh, the big house. Wow. And, Interesting, huh? And then when the big house was there, is that we? I always stayed in the bunkhouse. There was two sides in the bunkhouse. Yeah. There was the French side, and right. there was the English yes. side. Yes, yep. And so, but... And I never uh, used the privilege of going into the big house, even though I was in management. I said, no, yeah. until I'm invited, yeah. I'm not going. One day, Bill Sylvester, who you never met, came in and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I haven't been invited. Well, come over. So after that, I always stayed in the big yeah. house. I oh, loved, nice. loved it in Clayton. Yeah. It was absolutely so beautiful. so fun. I know. It's a great so, spot. Regional biologists, what yeah. are some of your responsibilities? Right, I mean, so we cover all wildlife species. So we say moose to mayflies. Um, so I mean, for example, this week, I've worked on a wood turtle project. We just calculated our deer permits yesterday. We had an injured bear. Um, we deal with a lot of moose mortality this time of year. So um, big nails thrush, any wildlife species, um, really any project, we sort of get involved at least at some point in the process. So, wow. Well, let's yeah, talk about some yeah, of those. So what did you do with the wood turtle? How did you count wood turtle? Do I um, count wood yeah. turtle turds? Oh, yeah. Some people, <laughs> do, we do a lot of turd counting, actually, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so we, we, as part of my role, we work on all big projects like environmental permitting. And so there's a dam that's being relicensed. And that gives us the opportunity to really look at like what the impacts are to species. And so we know that hydropower has an impact to wood turtles. And so we're working with 
um, the dam owner um, and some outside contractors to really assess where they are, look at their nesting habitat, and try to work on a plan to minimize impacts or enhance nesting habitat where we can. So, so the, the sort of wood turtles, they, what, what kind of habitat do they, are they upland? So riparian um, is their nesting habitat. They like really sandy soils, um, and they range pretty far throughout Maine. We had some of our wardens picked up one in King and Bartlett last year, and this is over far western Maine. Um, but really, if you think about the sandy sort of riparian stream habitat, and then they'll sort of move inland once they've nested. And, um, and what's their nesting there. time? Is it June? Um, right, yeah. So once things warm up, June is pretty much a sort of an extended period of nesting for them, but it's really the warm weather kind of triggers them. I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking on the Central Maine Power Project, I think that's why they got suspended in operations because oh. of the wood turtle. Was it wood turtle? It could have been bats as well. Oh, it was bats. Yeah. It was right. bats. Yeah. Yeah. So wood we turtles were mentioned. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. Okay. actually did bat work this week too. So we do, <laughs> I mean, it's this has been a busy week, but we do everything. So. Okay, so yeah. that's wood turtles. So, so right. one, are, are, there, are they endangered or are they just rare? Um, they are state special concern. So sort of worldwide, um, they are in decline. Maine, actually, our population seems fairly healthy, um, but we're still sort of figuring out where they are. We have a project right now called the Maine Amphibian Reptile Atlas Project. And um, this year's a big push. It's, it's the year before we're going to publish our sort of atlas for all the species. Um, but I mean, the, the record that I mentioned that the wardens picked up in King and Bartlett this year, that was the northernmost record for wood mm. turtles in our region. So, I mean, species that we know fairly well, we still don't have really great data on. But knowing that they're sort of imperiled in other parts of the world, we're really concerned about our main population because it's sort of a refuge for them. And, so we're pretty cautious. Nobody about. could have picked that turtle up someplace else and put it. Yeah, in that's camp. always a possibility. I mean, we see that occasionally. I, a couple of years ago, I had a turtle that is primarily in southern Maine that popped up, you know, well above here. And so when that happens, occasionally, you know, we suspect. And there are genetic tools that our biologists can use to sort of reference where that turtle came from to know specifically. Is um, their range but, expanding? Um, yeah, I'm, not that I know of. For turtles, it's probably a much slower process, but. A lot of other things are, and so um, in the case of turtles, it's probably that we've just never looked. You know, Maine's a big state, and yeah. so um, there are some places where we've just never surveyed. Um, but the habitat's there, and the, the climate is suitable, so yeah. they're around. What do they eat? Um, they forage on earthworms and, you know, any any type of sort of um, invertebrates they can find in the woods, yeah. And do they have a period of time that they live in the water, or is it just a... Uh, they, so they sort of are associated with it during their hibernation period in the winter, so sometimes it's in banks, sometimes it's in shallow depressions, but they're usually tied to it. Um, so springtime this time of year, once the daytime temperature is warmer than sort of the water temperature, they emerge and you find them basking along the bank. So yeah, they're really associated with now, right Do they go into vernal pools and eat the salamanders and the um, scary shrimp, as yeah, I, I think they move more upland. I mean, they're definitely associated with wetlands, but um, they have a variable diet. I think earthworms are... Um, a big part of it. They actually have this cool thing where they stomp their feet a little bit like um, woodcock do. Really? And so they'll be out there like, boom, 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 boom. like it's it's only been documented a few times where people actually recorded it, but huh. they'll stomp and kind of cause that vibration and cause the earthworms to come oh, through. Oh, no so, kidding. Yeah. Is that why the worms come out when it's raining? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. it's either, I don't know, I've heard that it's, a, they think it's a predator and so they're trying to escape, but I think it's probably like rain they sense oh, it and so they're trying yeah. to. Yeah, 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 that's right. I noticed this morning the yeah. ground is literally Yeah, with they're moving worms. up. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah. So. so bats, what, what right. did you do with bats? Yeah, so I've spent a lot of time working on bats throughout the country, actually. So um, we have eight species of bats. Um, back in the 2011, 2012, we had a fungus come through, white nose Study, syndrome. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so on the backside of that, we had several of our smaller bat species decline by over 90%. Wow. So we now have listed species of bats. And so same thing with a lot of big projects. When they come in, we look at... Um, potential impacts the project has on the species. So we try to minimize it, we try to conserve habitat. Um, so we have a, a project right now um, looking for bat hibernacula, so where they spend the winter. So traditionally we've thought they've been in caves, but now we know that they're also in talus slopes, so those big sort of jumbled rock areas yep. on hillsides huh. um, act as caves, and mm -hmm. so they'll actually spend the winter in there, and so we go out and, and survey for them. And Did you uh, study under Dr. Martin? No, but I have heard a lot about him. So uh, he was like the you know the first bat biologist in the state of Maine. Yeah. When I I I, started, I graduated in seventy. 
and I took mammalogy with him. Nice. And uh, we were scheduled to go to Mexico to study bats, but nice. I, I don't know what happened yeah. to the trip. Something yeah. broke down. I heard but a he story. A oh, yes. Well, I heard a story. He was in a big lecture hall. It was the first day of lecture, and he came in, and he released a bat out of his pocket in the lecture hall. <laughs> People were horrified, and yeah. it was flying around. So, so those so the old days. I yeah. know that uh, there's a person in Wilton, uh, Jan Collins, who is very concerned about bats. Oh, interesting. And she would go and they would listen for something with a microphone to yep. see whether they could right. determine where they were in the Wilton area. Yep. I've actually done a show on it, a TV oh, cool. show. She came in and did it. Huh. And last year, we had a bat that came to visit us in our house. Oh, huh. And so I, it, I caught it and put yep. it out like yep. that. And she, so she had said she had not heard, heard any bats. I said, well, you come up my neighborhood. Yeah. They're up here. Yeah, I know we do have a lot sure. of bats in houses. Do, do they yeah. really carry rabies? Um, they can. It's, you know, not every single bat does. But um, so we're pretty cautious about it. That's one of the things we do is we're available to the public. So people will call us or the wardens um, and say, I have a bat in my house. And so we have a process we go through. If there's no potential exposure, it's pretty safe to just kind of let them out. But if, you know, if... If there could be a human or a pet interaction, we actually work with the CDC, the State Rabies Lab, and submit those for testing. So all that information is online. You can actually go town by town and look at, you know, did Farmington have any rabid bats last year? It's all really? publicly available. Um, so before you yeah. go today, make sure you give yeah. Andre the uh, uh, site that they can oh, look yeah, at sure. so we can post yeah. that up there. Yep. Or, and a phone number that they can call yeah, for definitely. you. To, uh, yeah, call What's me. the phone number? Um, 778-4281. 4281 <laughs> Um, but I mean, we're all online too. If you just Google Maine Fish and Wildlife and oh, Sarah Boyden, you can find me. Are the bats me. coming back? Um, so some states are doing some pretty intensive surveys. The problem with Maine is we don't have the big hibernacula that they have in, say, Vermont or New York. So it's harder for us to track the trends. Um, our three hibernacula, the biggest one, we went from 500 myota species down to two. Um, after the you know after the fungus came through, so we two, know two that bats. Was two bats, yeah, in winter or wow. one, depending on the winter. Um, but these larger areas, you know, they had thousands of bats, so it's set up well to study it. And what they've seen is they've actually, you know, pit tags that you put in dogs, um, so they'll put those in bats. And they've been able to document some of the bats seem resistant to the fungus, oh, and good. so they're persisting and reproducing. Um, but in terms of getting back to that 90% recovery, it will be, you know, beyond my lifetime for these species. Some of them, you know, we may even see them sort of leave the state at some point. Mm -hmm. We have one species in particular that is um, very imperiled. So. I heard some discussion from a biologist that yeah. the fact that people were going into the caves and studying them, yeah. they were actually spreading the fungus. Yes, that's how really? it was spread yeah. initially. And yeah. so the theory is cavers, well, it was either the biologists or cavers, probably went to a different country, Asia potentially, and they brought uh, a novel uh, fungus back. And so, yeah, it had ended up, our bats weren't, they'd never experienced it before, and it really um, hit them hard. They had no resistance to it. But the survivors, we think, have some type of you know, genetic um, resistance to it. So. There's a little bit of survival happening. They are so important to yeah. the eating of mosquitoes. Yeah, mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I mean, anyone that fishes at night, you know, they remember the day when you're out on the lake at night and just bats swarming everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. Just, yeah. Well, as I said, we, we, uh, this bat, or there was some bats around the house, because yeah. so, I went out now and after that, yeah. that they're still there. And yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. You said you helped an injured moose. Um, well, it was a dead moose, yeah, oh, so um, <laughs> sometimes we get to help, but no, no, I did not bring it back to life. So this time of year is really, we see a lot of mortality from winter ticks, especially for our calves, and so um, we track all of that, where it occurs. We like to document that it was a heavy tick load, essentially, to really verify what the mortality was, because calves can die from them, you know, a number of different things, but... Um, we have some metrics that we look at, specifically tick load, and then what their femur marrow condition is. It's an indication of um, anemia. So um, we work with Lee Cantor, who has the larger project up in District 4. Um, and so he actually has collars on animals right now. And he's doing a similar thing, you know, real specific to that area. Um, and ours is sort of opportunistic. But, I mean, yeah, I'd say every week we have a handful of moose that come in. A lot of times it comes in from the game wardens, and they'll, you know, they'll sort of communicate that with us and, and we track all of that. But so yeah, are ticks uh, really bad for the They're animal? very bad, yeah. Um, so uh, a typical, it's really, it affects mostly, it affects calves and cows. Um, so calves, you think about, you know, they're, they're born early summer. Um, they're really trying to sort of fatten up and make it through the winter. And they hit their first winter and they just have these really heavy tick loads. Yeah. I mean, they're essentially just like replacing their blood supply over and over again because the tick load is so bad. So one estimate um, that I heard recently is 
there's so many ticks on a moose this time of year specifically when they're engorged. That's about 25 pounds of ticks that oh they're carrying goodness. around. Wow. Yeah, and so a lot of people don't see this because they don't spend time in the woods during mud season. But it's it is the season of death for for calves a lot of times, and every year is different. Um, so during moose season, we do tick counts on all harvested moose, and it gives us some prediction of what the mortality level is going to look like. So 30% is a, you know roughly a natural calf mortality level. When we start hitting 50%. You know, above that, then we know it's a it's a bad tick year. I uh, gotcha. So you're looking each year per se, so right? You know yeah. Where we are this year. Yeah. Um, I know that it was predicted to be a heavy year, um, but I don't know percentage wise. I mean, Lee will he's still sort of in the season right now. So March and April are really his busy year for mortality. But I mean, it's a pretty constant thing. He actually has a an app on his phone, so when a moose stops moving for 24 hours, I think he he gets a mortality yeah. signal, and so they try to get on the moose within 24 hours to get, you know, the samples they need before it gets predated. So he's got so. a bunch of uh, trackers out, out there so you can go yeah. out there and do the yeah. I was going to say, how do you yeah. find all these moose? Yeah. What, yeah, weather um, pre what weather yeah. is good for the growth of ticks? So what do we want? really it's triggered by climate change. So, you know, growing up here, you probably remember we had snow after Halloween. That yeah. was pretty constant. Yeah. Now you're lucky to have snow at Christmas. At Christmas. Yeah. And so that's the what we call the questing period for ticks. So that's the time of year when the adults are on the vegetation with their little feelers out trying to grab onto a moose that walks by. So the longer we have a period of no snow cover, the longer the questing period is for ticks. And so, you know, if we get an early snow, like a covering snow um, in October, that will knock them down a little bit. Um, there's also, I mean, we're still learning about it, but there's a lot of other things, windy weather, wet weather, you know, really affect ticks. But if you have sort of a dry, snow-free fall, um, they have a longer questing period, just a longer time to grab onto moose. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And these ticks don't affect people? They just um, No, they won't. I mean, I've definitely been bitten by one before, but they won't hold on to you. They're really yeah. looking for... Um, some type of protein probably in moose blood. They're real yeah. specific to moose. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because when I came up here from the University of Tennessee, yeah. it went down there when we worked in the woods, you did tick checks every yeah. night, every right. time you well, came back. Well, we do now and, here. And, yeah. and we didn't when yeah. I got here because right. I remember going out. One of my first jobs at the university was to go out and count deer brows, not oh. poop, but brows. Yeah, brows. And we went into these plots and we were pulling up wild cinnamon and a few other things and counting how much were in there. And then when yeah. I got ready to go, I said so the guy, I said, well, do you do a tick check? Why? They're not here. Yeah. And now we've got the gazillions of them. Yeah. I mean, my, fortunately, yeah. with my yard, because I spray my apple trees, yeah. my tick population is down. But Henry mm -hmm. still gets them because yeah. he wanders in the woods a little right. bit. Where, so Farmington's right on the line. I feel like, you know, you go a little bit further north, we still don't have them yet. But the line marches north every year. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. Part of our life now. So bear, what do you do with yeah. bear? Um, we don't do as much with bear in the region specifically. We still have the bear um, collar project, and so actually we just um, we have a new biologist in the region that'll be working with me that spent all winter going into dens. Um, oh, cool. So yeah, we still have that project looking at um, bear reproduction. So for us, bear, um, our involvement a lot of times is like managing people so this time of year we start getting a lot of calls from people who are seeing bears in our yard so we like to tell people you know this is the time of year you really want to take your bird feeders down and avoid any type of potential conflict for bear so that's we're a resource to the public really um, you know for the most part these problems are all very solvable pull your bird feeders in put your dog food away um, if you're a beekeeper install some really good electric fencing um, so we don't do any specific bear research in the region but um, earlier this week we had a report of an injured bear and so we we have bear traps that we can deploy to try to capture it but this bear moved on apparently yeah. we how was it injured to, you know foot? Um, it looked like it had a broken leg so bears are very resilient a lot of wildlife is actually um, and so my counterpart who spent quite a bit of time in the bear project with Randy Cross's crew um, he says it's not uncommon to see a three-legged bear in a den. And really? so they're, you know, it's obviously probably a harder life for them, but yeah. they can get around. Um, it's the same thing with deer. You know, we, I was just having a conversation the other day. There was a report of a, a deer with a broken leg, and then the, you know, the landowners reported next spring that it was still around, and, you know, it had healed. But so from our perspective, we really try to give wildlife the benefit of the doubt in making a decision if it's, you know, humane to let them persist. And so our goal with trapping that bear was just to get a close look at it and, 
you know, we really would just make a decision. Is this bear able to get around on its own? And for the most part, they can. They're pretty amazing. So you, yeah. you work with deer, too? Yeah. Yes. You've got it all. Yeah, I do. So what's going on with deer around here? Um, do you know where I can get my buck next year? So, yeah, I can tell you where I got my buck last year. Oh. <laughs> um, I That's mean, not fair. <laughs> <laughs> You have more um, time. Yeah, well, yeah, time is always the factor, isn't it? Um, so we've had a couple of pretty easy winners. I would say permit-wise, I mean, we're going to, you'll see the numbers change this year just for the fact that the permit system has changed a little bit. So it, our permits won't be as many, but people will have more opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, instead of an any deer, you have an antlerless permit now. Yeah. Um, but I think overall, there, at least in this region, winters have been pretty mild, and so survival, you know, is, is usually pretty good in the winter. Yeah. And so when that happens, we sort of turn our permits up to account for it, survival. Um, I remember uh, um, back when I was on the Fish and Wildlife Committee, learning about deer and their starvation the diets. Basically, right, yeah. That the by December, they have to have their fat packed on. Yep. Because they're yep. going to go through, I think it was a 90-day period, roughly, that yep. that fat would come off of In their decline. body. Yeah. And so yep. they get to that end of 90 days. So if you December, January, February, if you still got two feet of snow on mm -hmm. the ground in March, you're yep. making it tough for them right. to exactly. survive. Forget the predators. Yeah. But yep. you, and, and that when we would have those winters where we would have April snows, mm -hmm. it was a killer to yeah. them because yeah. they Killing really snow. were starving. To yeah. Death. So, I mean, this year is an example of a really mild year. I mean, we were having bare conditions, you know, three or four weeks ago in some yeah. of our deer yards. And so we see it um, in winters like this, you know, deer are very spread out. They don't tend to yard up as much. They're in really high elevations late in the season. Um, so it's a much milder, easier winter for them. But yeah, so yeah, I'm just growing my I'm growing my buck really big, so yeah. bigger, 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 I shouldn't know off the top of my head what our age record is, but I, I can't think off. So you work with mayflies, too? We do occasionally, yep. Do you so we count have, their poop? No, oh, well, no. you could. You actually look at their habitat. Um, <laughs> you can look at their different life phases. But um, So, again, that gets tied back to environmental permitting, so big projects, wind power, you know, all of the big projects, roads sometimes. Um, we Anytime there's a species that's listed as endangered or threatened or a special concern, um, when a project comes in, we look at that project sort of impact area. And if there's habitat, we really work with the developer, um, n not to shut projects down, but really right. to try to minimize impacts to species. So that's our goal. Mm -hmm. We avoid it when we can, we minimize it, and then when that's not possible, we work to sort of um, preserve or create habitat in another location to sort of off offset that impact. Do you, now you don't do much with fisheries though. No, we're, we're totally separate. So I think you're going to talk to our fisheries biologist here in a couple weeks. Yep. So this is the first job that I've had where you don't sort of combine everything. It's a very separate um, sort of role. We're all in the same office and we talk to each other. And hopefully a new office. Um, well, so yes, Augusta, yeah, they are working on that. But so I'm. <laughs> That's on the appropriate. <laughs> it's a different world, table. yeah. So. Yeah, change who's one up and strong, closer. Uh, no, the no. no strong will be strong. We have our own little sort of satellite office. Over yeah, there. they're going to combine yeah. Bangor and some right. of the other yep. so three locations yeah. into yeah. A, a site on Water Street yeah. in Augusta, yeah. which happens to be a brownfield site. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So there's yeah. no other use for it other than right. to put biologists <laughs> there from you what go. we can tell. We're used to it. But, yeah. the, well, it's it's on the appropriations table, mm -hmm. so we don't yeah. know what the future right. is. Right, yeah. Great project. So what's your favorite part of the job? Being in the field. I mean, you know, we all would be in the woods every day and um, as much as we can. Um, I, I'll i do anything, though, honestly. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Serving for bats or going to scoop up a moose, you know. <laughs> so pretty much if I could be in the woods as far out as possible, places how, I've never been. How before. about turkeys? That's an interesting oh, yeah. 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 about turkeys, sure. yeah. 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 Besides so. those legislators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've made some changes in the tagging right, yep. of turkeys. It right. can be done electronically. Sure, so this year it will be the same. Same, yes. Right, and then we'll see the change happen next year, but it'll be exactly the same last year. So in terms of turkeys, you know, unless we have a real specific projects, so we worked with Kelsey Sullivan, our, our upland game bird, a couple years ago, and we did, actually did turkey trapping to monitor for disease and just look at survival. Um, but, you know, occasionally we have special projects, like some of our biologists were working with um, 
a, a project that transported turkeys to Texas to help repopulate certain areas there. But They're I mean, gonna be sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, day to day, our involvement is nuisance. So you know, we have people yeah. with turkeys eating their crab apples or whatever. So we we do that type of stuff. Um, and then disease monitoring for all species is a really big part of what we do. So. Has the influenza hit the turkeys yet? Um, they're not, as far as we know, so last time it came through, I forget if it was like 2015, they didn't seem like they were very susceptible to it, not to say they're immune to it, mm -hmm. um, but so far we've not had any confirmed records of turkeys with avian influenza. Yeah, th that can get real ugly. There are like right, 20 yeah. locations in Maine that yeah, have been yeah. discovered, and I, uh, yeah. I race homing pigeons. And yeah. Luckily, pigeons aren't affected by the influenza. Right, so some birds don't seem to be as susceptible yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. But, yeah. Turkeys are so, so interesting because they weren't going to survive in Maine. Right. Or go yeah. back before you came back to be a regional biologist, yeah. you had to have a special dispensation almost to shoot one. Yeah, oh, yeah. Be in the lottery. Right. And it felt wrong. Get, yeah. yeah. I then, mean, we never had them growing up, you know, in central yeah, Maine. No. Until now they're all back. over the place. Yeah. I mean, you drive the range well. and they cross the road yeah. up yeah, there. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, right. And again, I think it's part to climate change because the, yeah. the, the woodlands opens up sooner mm -hmm. so that they can find yeah, food. Sure. Yeah. And then they go into yeah. some of the old fields and then they go into the farmer's yeah. <laughs> silos, silo and yeah. mess that up real yeah. good. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I've been very lucky with my apple trees that they have not come into the yard. Although one day I was working downstairs and I look out the window and there was a. Oh, yeah, So I went out and scared the devil out of them. Yeah, came back. I think it's brought toes. because of Henry scent is out there and they, they stay away yeah, from that. Yeah, they're pretty leery. One year yeah. they cleaned out our high bush blueberries. We've um, got about 60 yeah. plants yeah. and they came in one late afternoon. Delicious. Just yeah. Wiped them out. But my German Shepherds kind of. Yeah. It took they care of they're smart. They avoid. Yeah. yeah. So again, you, you love this job. Yeah. Sounds like this it. is a dream job. I mean, I, you know, if you talk to any of us, I'd say the majority of us get in these positions and we stay for our entire career, you know, 20, 30 years. So it's hard not to like it. Every day is different, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it. You come in, you never know what's going to be on the right, table exactly. for you. Right, exactly. I've got to yeah. go up, oh, i got to go find this yeah, moose. Or go i got to go check out there, what the trap of yeah. there. It sounds like yeah. an exciting job. Yeah, it is. You know, so with funny. foresters, all we did is go down and chop trees down. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the woods too, though. I mean, that was a tough decision, forestry or wildlife. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. no, I, I, I can remember making the decision to go into forestry instead yeah. of engineering and telling oh, my father. And my decision. father said, well, you'll never make any money here, yeah. but dad will be happy. Yeah. And I still, even now, I, even though I yeah. don't go walk in the woods, I watched this thing last night where they talk about putting this virtual relaxation for hospital workers and it's going into the woods. And I'm saying, <laughs> just get up out of your chair and walk into the woods. You don't need this. Multiple it's benefits just there. Like unbelievable. I know. And it's, it's, it's like outside our door. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's so much enjoyable. Yeah. Sarah, I really appreciate yeah, coming on. Maybe, maybe the, I'll ask Mark, well, see if the crew wants to go out with you for a day, <laughs> a part go. of the day. You, yeah, definitely. You pick some of that wealth. Yeah, I think that would be sure. fun. Yeah, we have lots By the of way, I still need to go to my bear den. I'm going to tell Julie. Oh, yes. I, was on the I have some connections. Oh, oh good. Talk. Now we got it. I do, Sarah. actually. All right, nice right. good, Sarah. Yeah. We'll be in touch. Okay. Great. Scotty. Oops, 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 oops. Scotty. Oops, oops, oops. Yeah, whoops. We'll have you come on special at the end of the session. Sure. Sarah, that was really great. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, So we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in for Talk of